Good morning and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Dave Deacon. We had a pretty wet spring across the state, which means that fly and mosquito numbers are going to be up. This morning on the show, we're going to be taking a look at some ways that producers can help their cattle and horses make it through a steamy summer. With more information on that, here's Extension Livestock Entomologist Justin Talley. And so in particular, what we want to think about is there, well, the, the particular flies on cattle right now. We have three main species that we're, we're worried about uh, getting on cattle. One is our stable flies that are normally biting them on the legs and then what they particularly do cause a lot of pain for the cattle so it'll cause them to bunch up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have uh, horn flies that are typical in Oklahoma that we see every year that are a smaller fly that cluster up on the back and side. It can cause a lot of production losses if left untreated. And then uh, lastly, we do have a fly in Oklahoma that can uh, transmit a particular uh, pathogen that causes pink eye, and that's known as face fly. With, with the face fly, it, it, it is, is there anything that can be done about, uh, about the possible transmission of pink eye? One of the best things that are out there for face flies in general is to put an insecticide ear tag in the cattle and one that's usually in the pyrethroid class because it'll not only it could kill those flies but it could also repel those flies. The other thing is, is just some preventative things that if you have a uh, pink eye within your herd, just make sure you're taking some proper uh, sanitation uh, practices when you're handling each anim animal so you're not transmitting that, that pathogen, which is, which is a bacteria. And so uh, it's a bacteria that causes uh, pink eye known as Morax aliobobus. Mm -hmm. And once you get that bacteria within your herd, sometimes it can just be transmitted from animal to animal, from, from grass to animal, uh, from just handling the animals. And then flies can be a small component of that. And in particular, face flies are, are specialists mm -hmm. because they have a structure that allows them to scratch the eye a little bit better, more so than a house fly would. And so that's why they're better at transmitting the pathogen that causes pink eye. And in general, we're not too worried about about uh, pink eye transmitted by house flies. You'll see house flies out there, but if you see a lot of flies are in and around the face and you start seeing a higher uh, occurrence of pink eye, then you probably need to implement some kind of fly control. There, there, there's also been some, some word about uh, possibility of, of some mosquito-borne uh, yeah, so what we certainly need to be concerned with is this year's um, amount of mosquitoes that are out there. In particular for horse owners, you need to make sure you're up to date on your boosters with the West Nile virus vac vaccinations. And we have mosquitoes that are not only active year to year, but we'll probably have an abundance of mosquitoes, especially as it warms up and dries out a little bit. Because the excessive rain, there's not a lot of mosquitoes, but when, when that excessive rain starts to dry down and there's pockets of standing water, then that's when our mosquito population can be, uh, can really uh, be prolific and, and, and cause some issues with West Nile virus, especially among horses. Is, is there anything that, that producers can do to, to control the mosquitoes aside from just flipping uh, a bird feeder or, or whatever? Yeah, so the biggest thing about mosquitoes in and around horse operations is that try to find those breeding sources so standing water if there's standing water you need to either treat that water with a larvicide or uh, get rid of that water think about where the mosquitoes could be resting and so if you have a uh, a lot of weeds broadleaf weeds around your barn your horse barn or around horse stalls then it's harboring mosquito resting sites where and a lot of people aren't thinking about that because they don't necessarily see it and it, it's really ineffective to treat those other than just uh, getting rid of, rid of the weeds. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Justin Talley, Extension Livestock Entomologist with Oklahoma State University. Welcome to the Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. It was another very hot stretch for Oklahomans to endure this past week. Many parts of western Oklahoma reached 100 on Tuesday as indicated by the red in this state map. Those that didn't reach the century mark were not far behind. The temperatures alone would be more tolerable if it wasn't for the added humidity left over from all the spring rain. 
This chart shows the smooth average maximum relative humidity levels as compared to the long-term average. Every day above the zero line would be higher than what was expected. There has been only two weeks all year that came in below the line, one in late March and another in middle April. Adding temperature and humidity gives us the heat index or felt temperature. On July 16th, the numbers reached the oppressive teen range. The highest was recorded at 116 at Antlers, but Tishomingo was just one degree behind. A break is not expected until early next week. There is one crop cotton that is appreciative of this heat. Due to a wet, cool start, it needed a heat boost to catch up. This degree day table for Altus shows that is exactly what has happened. On Tuesday, they reached 1175, right in line with the five-year average. Now here's Gary reminiscing about past rainfall. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. Well, I'm afraid we have something to discuss that we've really been able to avoid for the last couple of months, and that's the U.S. Drought Monitor. So let's get straight to that new map and see what we have. Now it's going to be really hard to see, but if you get really, really close to your TV, you can just tell a little bit of that yellow, abnormally dry color down in far southwestern Oklahoma, but it is a start of something that we're going to have to watch uh, over the next few weeks now that we're into the heat and the rainfall is pretty much shut off. Now speaking of that rainfall, if we look at the Mesonet map for the last 30 days, we see Eastern Oklahoma has generally had some really good rains from four to as many as 10 inches in some places. So good rains across that area. As you go further to the west though, it drops down to two inches or less in most locations. Now if you look at that same time period for the percent of normal rainfall, what we'd normally expect for this, this time of the year, the last 30 days, um, we can see again some above normal rainfall across much of the eastern third of the state. But as you go to the west, we drop down below 75% of normal. So this dry weather and heat is having an impact on the soil moisture. If we look at the 10 inch fractional water index, uh, one is basically wet, zero is all the way dry. We see the areas across western Oklahoma that soil is down to the very dry conditions, uh, less than 0.2 uh, down across southwest Oklahoma and then scattered around uh, other areas including the Oklahoma Panhandle. So that soil is being dry out as well. Impacts from the lack of rainfall and the tremendous heat that we're seeing over the last week or so. We are expected to get a little bit cooler uh, early next week, but we'll have to see what happens from that point to see if we need to put more color on this uh, drought monitor map or maybe back it off a little bit. But we'll keep an eye on it. And that's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're in the dog days of summer, which means the Johnson grass is tall and full. And Alex, why is Johnson grass so hard to kill? Well, I can show to you why it's so hard to kill. See. That's the secret of Johnson grass. Johnson grass has rhizomes. Other grasses may not have this structure. And what this is, is a reserve organ that stay uh, underground in the soil. And what happens is all the time that you spray something or you mow or you graze, what's gonna happen is the plants are gonna come up back from new shoots, as you can see here, bringing it up again, more stems and leaves. So that's why it's so hard to kill. You kill and it will come back because it has the energy down there. So when it comes to management, obviously there's a lot of different options that producers have to choose from. Let's kind of talk about some of those. Okay, uh, I would start with grazing as uh, management to control Johnson grass. It's, it's pretty common when you see a kind of a pasture that is being intensively grazed where there is no Johnson grass, but you look just over the fence and there are some Johnson grass. That happens because if you keep the cattle there all the time, this is an ice cream plant. The cattle you love to graze Johnson grass. So what happens is, as soon as come new shoots, the animal is gonna come and graze them. And so we start to starve the rhizomes and the plants will disappear over time. So the second option would be mowing. If you constantly keep mowing, when the, the, we see that the new leaves come and you keep mowing, you are gonna be doing the same, starving the rhizomes but mowing might be expensive also. So that's where we can go with some chemical uh, and control by applying some herbicides. There are different herbicides labeled to control Johnson grass. 
However, uh, we know that glyphosate is a very, uh, I would say, economical way to control, but also can harm, for instance, the Bermuda grass, the other warm season uh, desirable fodders that we have there. So that's where I think that wicking Johnson grass with glyphosate is a very good and viable option. So let's talk about that. What, what exactly is wicking? Well, wicking, I would say that's a selective way uh, to control a specific weed. Uh, for instance, as I mentioned, uh, as you can see here, we have the Bermuda grass and also you have the Johnson grass. If you come here and you spray uh, the, the, the herbicide, in this case glyphosate, you harm our Bermuda grass as well and you don't want that. So it, there is a method that by a sponge or a robe where we are going to be just delivering that uh, chemical, the herbicide, is specific to the Johnson grass. That's what wicking uh, in simple words is. All right, thanks, Alex. For more information on controlling Johnson grass using herbicides, here's our extension weed specialist, Misa Manicheri. Yeah, so there's a number of herbicides that we can apply post-emergence um, in Bermuda grass to control Johnson grass. One of the more effective products is glyphosate. However, it also can injure the Bermuda, so we're always trying to balance weed control with not injuring our target crop um, or plant. So one thing that we can do to minimize the injury with Bermuda but still have that effective glyphosate is to wick it on. So it's a, it's a very manual process. There's all different kinds of applicators. Uh, folks make their own, they can purchase them. Um, usually you see a, a rope or some kind of sponge and basically you fill up a tube, it's usually made of PVC pipe, with your solution. Um, those rates start at a third glyphosate to water, so a 33% solution. And you mix it up in that tube and you let those wicks get concentrated and you touch the plants. Glyphosate moves in living tissue, and so once we have contact, we get absorption and movement. So one thing, um, once you have your solution and it's not dripping from your wicks or your sponge, if you don't have ground that's really uniform, you want to have a good concentration that is just going on to plants, not dripping all over your field. And then another thing to take into consideration consideration is pass direction. So a lot of research has um, documented that more than one pass will actually increase efficacy, which makes sense. We wipe one way. Sometimes we might kind of want to offset and go diagonally or the opposite direction so that we get good contact. And for more information on um, detailed herbicide management practices for Johnson grass control and wicking, go to sunup.okstate.edu. It's summertime and that means Daryl's been on adventures and Daryl, you've been all over the country. How, how, how do conditions look where you've been traveling? Well, over the last month or so, I've traveled uh, from here up through Wyoming into Montana, a little bit over in Idaho and then back uh, across Nebraska on the way home. Um, you know, I guess the, the, the word that comes to mind, of course, is green. We've had lots of moisture. Forage conditions look very good in many places. Um, so much so that hay production has been a challenge, and that's probably the biggest thing I've seen. Hay production's been delayed in many cases because of excess moisture. Challenges getting it up, uh, both quantity and quality, is going to be a little bit of an issue. Corn conditions that I've seen in uh, you know central and western Nebraska vary a lot from uh, just above knee high to shoulder high. So we're going to see a widely variable corn crop uh, as we reach uh, or move towards maturity here later in the summer. As as we are here in the southern Great Plains. It, it is green and they're cutting hay right now. Do you think that hay stocks will remain you know, moderate throughout the, the season? You know, there's a lot of concern right now about hay uh, conditions. We started the year with very low hay stocks nationally. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the dairy industry is probably the first to be concerned. They're concerned about both quantity and quality of hay. Uh, and, there, and there have been lots of challenges in many regions in, in terms of hay production. Uh, so I think it's something we have to keep an eye on. Beef cattle, of course, use a wider variety of qualities of hay. So it'll be something we have to really watch from a nutritional standpoint next fall. Had some good news last week in, in, the, in the price of cattle. Had a little bit of positive movement there. What's driving that? 
Well, I think there's several things going on again. This cattle market's kind of trying to find some direction. Some of it's coming out of the fact that both alive and feeder cattle futures have gone through a fairly serious correction, arguably a little bit overdone, so it was probably time for a little bit of bounce in that. Um, you know, feeder cattle, again, with the corn market kind of weighing on it, uh, and this futures market sort of weighing on it, uh, uh, have moved counter seasonally lower, especially for the heavy feeder cattle. They normally move higher through the summer and peak in, in late July or in August. Uh, we may be back on track to see a little bit of that seasonal pattern here as we go forward. Fed cattle, uh, you know, it's probably a little early to be sure we've got a summer low in. That usually doesn't happen till late August or Labor Day, uh, but it could be. And so I think, again, we kind of watch going forward. Uh, we still got some hot summer doldrums here to get through, uh, you know, from that standpoint before we can really see uh, our way into uh, kind of what those fall markets are going to look like. Well, you did talk about that a little bit, and, and, and let's drill down a little bit to the most recent part of it. July 4th, we made it through there. How does beef look as we move forward? You know, from a demand standpoint, it's also been a bit of a challenge and certainly an unknown this year. Uh, by and large, we have not had good grilling weather this year. Uh, summer seems to finally be here, but it's only just recently arrived. So, uh, you know, box beef prices uh, peaked early in April, dropped uh, seasonally, and they're normally dropping this time of the year. Uh, and actually, they're a little bit above where they were last year at this point in time, at least for choice prices. Select prices have weakened more. We've got a counter seasonally larger choice select spread going on right now. So again, there's a lot of uncertainty. The latest trade data was generally positive. Exports were about equal to last year for the first time this year, not being lower. Um, but again, uh, on a product by product basis, there's still a lot of uncertainty about what's going on in those markets. So I think all of these cattle and beef markets are kind of looking for a little sense of direction here through the heat of the summer. Globally speaking, is, is there any opportunity for growth in the, in the beef markets? Well, I think all of the protein markets are still waiting to kind of see how this situation in China plays out with African swine fever. Uh, clearly, there's going to be a deficit of protein in China. Uh, the pork industry in the U.S. continues to expand. We've got large supplies and we've been anticipating, even with the tariffs in place, that there would be more demand from China hasn't really materialized, at least not in a sustained way yet. So we've got some extra pork weighing on the market right now in the U.S. Uh, wholesale pork values are weakening. That's probably adding some pressure. That said, at some point in time, there is going to be more direct and indirect opportunities for protein markets, including beef, uh, as a result of the situation in China. Okay, thank you very much. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Last week, we visited with you on the Cow-Calf Corner about the impact of uh, uh, an Oklahoma heat dome might have on reproductive capabilities of uh, your cow herd. I thought this week and again next week, we'd go into more detail about what impacts uh, these high ambient temperatures have on cattle. First of all, this week, let's look at the male side or the impact of a consistent hot summer days might have on bull and bull fertility. Research has been done uh, for a number of years, clear back into the 60s, but more recently here in Oklahoma, some work was done in the late 70s, early 80s, looking specifically at the impact of heat stress on bulls and bull fertility. If you look at this particular graphic, this shows basically what happens when a, a set of bulls, half of which are left in a normal, very comfortable 73 degree environment over the 16 week period of this study, compared with the other half of the bulls that were exposed to each day, eight hours of 95 degrees, and then the other 16 hours of the day, they uh, had uh, roughly 87 degrees around them. Those that had that hot temperature consistently for eight weeks, you can see what happens to their semen quality and therefore the bull fertility. It drops consistently from uh, having semen motility of up around 75% clear down to less than 50%. Once those bulls were put back into a very comfortable 73 degree environment, it took them eight more weeks to return to normal fertility as compared to their counterparts that were left in that comfortable environment. So this tells me again that we want to really think about 
breeding seasons for cattle in Oklahoma. From the bull side, we know that heat stress can reduce bull fertility and have a real impact on the percentage of cows that get bred in that period of time. Plus, if we have that heat stress that causes some insult to that bull, then it's going to take another eight weeks for him to return to total normalcy in terms of his fertility. I'll emphasize to you that this is not an all or none situation. It's a change in the percentage of the cows that these bulls get bred in that particular period of time. But it's a percentage that goes in the wrong direction and can certainly affect our bottom line. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week as we'll visit more about the impact of heat stress on beef cattle here in Oklahoma. Well, it's starting to dry out across the state, but we're still feeling the effects of the rain and the fl uh, recent flooding. And Chris, uh, some of the effects we're feeling that it from is from hay. Sure. So our hay producers um, it took a lot longer to get into the hay or the hay fields for the first cutting just because the fields are, were so wet, which has now backed up their second cutting. And so our horse owners really need to think about maybe their hay supplies or their normal supplier may not actually produce as much this year as in years past. And what about the hay that had already been cut that had maybe been laying out in the fields? Um, we all saw the pictures of, you know, flooding just all the way up to the tops of them. Oh, sure. I know when I was driving around, um, you would see hay bales that were half submerged in the floodwaters. And so we really encourage, but do not feed those um, as a food supply for animals. Uh, we don't know what contaminants are actually in those floodwaters. So um, all of that moisture content too, and the fermentation that would have taken place in the spoilage, those aren't gonna be suitable feedstuffs anymore. And even though they're not suitable feedstuff, they're actually not really safe for humans as well. If they're, you know, they're affecting the animal, they'll probably affect us as well. Well, yeah, even if we're not talking about hay that was saturated, like standing halfway deep, even if it was really, really wet, you probably have a pretty good chance there are molds in there, um, spores that can really affect animal health. Um, so you may see decreased performance with them if they're trying to eat moldy feed. Um, if animals are inside moldy feed, that's really hard on their uh, respiratory systems. And yes, our humans, if you're having to handle that a lot, it can affect you too. In regards of disposal of that hay that's just laying out in the field, what should people do? Uh, so that's a good question because, you know, right now we're harvesting hay and they need to put those round bales up and need to get those old spoiled bales out of the way. So there's a couple different avenues. Um, it actually is good compost material, so you can think about composting that hay. We'd encourage people to maybe even find some folks that need hay uh, for composting. You know, our bigger farms that might compost their mortalities, this is a great use of that carbon source um, to help them out. Um, also for construction where they're trying to deal with erosion, roadways, etc. So there actually may be people out there that find some value in your spoiled hay. So because of all of our, you know, strange weather conditions this year, people really do need to be thinking about their hay supply, even if you weren't in the middle of the flooding zone. So just my own personal story, the gentleman that I get my hay from every year, I picked up some hay because I knew it's probably time to start calling ahead. And he has nowhere near the amount of hay already put up this time of year now as compared to years in the past. So people really need to think about that and don't just put it off until later when you have to buy your hay supply through the winter. Um, you may need to be thinking about increased prices, supply, and certainly as we go down the road, we may need to think about alternative forage sources. All righty, thanks, Chris. Chris Heine, Extension Equine Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. We're moving seed wheat behind us, and Kim, we're in that time between harvest and, and planting. How are things looking with Oklahoma wheat right now? Well, if you look at uh, what normally happens with Oklahoma wheat in June, July, and August, we normally sell, oh, 50 to 60 percent of that wheat off, maybe even up to 70 some years. So producers are looking at when to move that. You go back to the price the last couple of weeks. We got a 45 cent price run up. Then we took about 40 cents off of it. That's the kind of volatility we're going to have. And to understand what's happening there, you gotta go over to the Black Sea area of Russia, Ukraine, both in their, their early harvest. Russia's wheat's coming in 13 plus protein, maybe a little high. Russia sold wheat into Egypt, uh, slightly higher, about uh, 20 cents higher price. And so a lot's going on in the market and a lot of decisions are being made. Do I, when do I sell my wheat? And how much wheat do I, I plant next year? With the potential smaller uh, corn crop coming up, 
Is there potential for some of this wheat to be going into uh, cattle production? Well, it's a lot depends on what happens with this corn. You know, there's the big uncertainty on how many corn planted acres we got, big uncertainty on what is the crop condition of the corn, uh, just how much corn will we produce. The market's all up in arms about that because nobody really knows until USDA comes out with their next report. So that creates uncertainty in the corn market. That also creates uncertainty in wheat. But if we can lose some, some corn production, we will move some wheat and we need to move some wheat into that feed market. That'd be good for us. And of course, soybeans are, are, are growing across the state right now. It's been a year since uh, the tariffs with China were announced. How are we with the with with not only the negotiations, but also the, the price. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, there, but you know what I said about uh, Russian, some of that wheat in Egypt, higher price? Well, part of that was their, their transportation, ocean transportation is about four and a half cents a bushel less than it was a couple months ago. What we've seen because of the China deal, China has the lowest increase in their economy in 26 years. You look around the world, a lot of product, a lot of, of are, is still in the warehouse. They say that there's excess transportation, both uh, road, extra, uh, road tra excess road transportation, rail transportation, and ocean transportation. So you got lower transportation rates. Well, that helps us move this stuff over to our overseas markets. How long, uh, how long can, can Oklahoma producers expect this to go on financially? Well, if you look at uh, on the wheat production, you look at uh, what the prediction is over the, the next 10 years, it's an average price of about $5 per bushel. So you're looking at relatively low prices for the next, now will it be $5? No, right. it might average over that. That means we're gonna have some low fours, we're gonna probably have some high sixes, maybe even sevens in there. But if you can't produce wheat for $5 a bushel, you might already try, try to produce something else. Okay, thank you very much, Kim Anderson. Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Well, that does it for us this week on SUNUP. If there was something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. I'm Dave Deacon. Remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SUNUP.